Well, this is most certainly a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship with us here at Calvary. I am Pastor Ben, and it is good to be with each and every one of you today. A warm welcome if you are new or visiting today. I invite you to take a look at this connection card found in the pew in front of you. For here at Calvary, we seek, uh, we are called to form disciples one connection at a time, and we'd love to be in contact with you. So fill this uh, little card out and leave it in the offering plate as that comes around later today. Everything you need for today's service can be found up on the screen over my shoulder. The only other place you will want to reach this morning is for that red hymnal in the pew in front of you. So please join us in singing and responding throughout worship today. Today is a special Sunday. We celebrate all the saints of our lives, those who have died in faith and have gone before us on a journey that we each will go on someday. And we honor the lives of the saints who have died in this last year by lighting a candle in their memory, but we also hold the memory of all of our loved ones who have died in faith today. So, whoever you have in mind today, whoever you are carrying, they are welcome here, and we hold that space. We are also continuing our narrative lectionary journey where we started earlier this fall in the book of Genesis, and we are working our way to the book of Acts later this spring in more or less chronological order. Last week, we uh, heard about Solomon building the temple and dedicating the temple in Jerusalem as a symbol that God dwells among the people there now, but even Solomon in his wisdom had to recognize that God could not be contained within a building. Well, after the dedication of the temple, God appears to Solomon and renews the covenant, but warning Solomon that disobedience will bring disaster. So Solomon continues his reign and becomes renowned for his wisdom and wealth and uh, ends up uh, having a visit from the Queen of Sheba, a a refined dignitary in in their world. Well, Solomon... uh, has many foreign wives at this point and is led into idolatry. And because of that, God declares that most of the kingdom will be torn from his son, sons, but not all of them for David's sake. God's honoring that covenant that he made with David long ago. After Solomon dies, uh, his, the kingdom ends up being split into two. One of his sons, Rehoboam, takes over for him as king, and he institutes some really harsh policies in Israel, causing ten of the tribes to rebel and secede, forming the northern kingdom of Israel under a man named Jeroboam. Rehoboam retains only Judah, which becomes known as the southern kingdom. Jeroboam in the north leads Israel into idol worship and creating golden calves at Bethel and Dan. And God condemns Jeroboam and Rehoboam for their unfaithfulness and predicts the downfall of both kingdoms. From there, our story gets split into two alternative narratives between the kings of Judah in the south and the kings of Israel in the north. In Judah, King Asa is mostly faithful to God, while in Israel, a series of kings arise, and they are wicked kings. And this culminates with King Ahab, who leads Israel deeper into idolatry. And that is where we pick up our story today with King Ahab in power and a wild prophet who suddenly appears on the stage with no preamble, no history of this prophet, he just shows up before King Ahab and declares to him that a drought will be brought upon all the land. And so we hear this story of Elijah confronting uh, King Ahab and uh, how God provides for Elijah in the midst of this drought. And we hear it in three distinct stories that are woven together. God provides for Elijah uh, through a wadi, a temporary riverbed uh, where he finds a drink and eats foods that is brought to him by scavenger birds. Elijah is then sent to a widow who cares for him in his need, and in turn, Elijah is able to care for the widow's son when he falls ill. So today we wonder about how God cares for us and provides for us in the midst of things that we do not fully understand as we face our own mortality and wonder how God provides for us even in the face of death. 
So listen for those themes as we continue in worship today. I invite you now to stand as you are comfortable as we begin worship at the font with a thanksgiving for baptism. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Holy God, fountain of living water, source of mercy, tender and mighty, you are clothed with majesty and splendor. Your steadfast love fills the earth. Your steadfast love fills the earth. Your love flows through water, satisfying the thirst of all living things, sustaining life in this community, nourishing and delighting us. We bless you for these gifts of water. Your steadfast love fills the earth. Your steadfast love fills the earth. Your love flows through water, a sign of your saving power. Noah and the animals survive the flood. Hagar discovers your well. The Israelites escape through the sea and they drink from your gushing rock. Naaman washes his leprosy away and the Samaritan woman will never be thirsty again. Your steadfast love fills the earth. Your steadfast love fills the earth. Your love flows through the water of baptism the very same that washed over your blessed saints, who we remember now. We remember. Let's start that again with we remember. We remember. Lula Annie Johnson. Ramona Eliason, Robert Rutherford, we remember Jeanette Pixie Kujawa, Theodore Hatz, Shirley Jean Moore. We remember Betty Ranke, Conrad Connie Reinhold, Thomas DeBosch. We remember Carol Lawrence, Richard Dick Hansen. Eileen Ruskowski. We remember. Lloyd Roy Gutzman. Sharon Lubke. Mary Nowak. We remember. Jacqueline Jackie Ditloff. Wayne Vanderkam, Mary Jean MJ France, we remember Daniel Dan Hoffman, Darwin Bohm. Your love flows through the water of baptism, joined to your life-giving word. Your well of mercy and cleansing flood, your sea of deliverance from death into life, your healing river washing sin away, your living, spring, your living water springing up to external life. Your steadfast love fills the earth. Your steadfast love fills the earth. Shower us with your Holy Spirit, fill us with your love, clothe us with all your people with grace. We give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We sing.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We pray. God of compassion, by the power of God, Elijah provided bread and oil for the widow and her household. By faith in God, the widow provided food and water for Elijah. Give us hearts to love one another, so that in providing and in receiving, we too might experience the unimaginable power of God through the one who has provided life itself, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You might now may be seated as we invite all of our children or any of those feeling particularly young at heart to come forward and join Miss Angel and I for a children's message. Good morning. We still got some coming on up. Well, while we wait, why don't you guys grab a fruit snack? Because you know you get one every week. Okay, so today is a very special holiday in the church. Does anyone know what it is? What is it? All Saints Day, yeah. So we celebrate this holiday every year, beginning of November. And when you look at the altar, there is a candle up there for everyone who has passed from the church this year. And then when you look out into the crowd, there's probably family members, friends of each one of those candles up there. So today is kind of a sad holiday. But it's also a happy holiday because all of those wonderful people are in heaven and they are all saints. And when we pass, we're going to be in heaven with them, and we'll be saints. And every single Sunday when we take communion, we're also taking communion in remembrance and with all of those people and all the other people that have passed. And on this special holiday, I like to light my own candle for some of the family members and friends of mine who have passed. So I thought it'd be really cool if we could all think in our head of someone who has passed. It doesn't have to be this year. Grandma, grandpa, friends, maybe even a pet. And think about their memory. And then when I light this candle, it'll be in remembrance of my friends and family and also your guys's. Okay? I want to share with you a story of someone that I hold dearly on this day. My grandpa, we called him Papa. I'm sure you have uh, fun names for your grandparents as well. Well, Papa wore cardigans like this, and when he died, I inherited this cardigan. And I keep it in my office because my Papa really taught me what it meant to have faith. Do you think all of the saints up there and all the saints in the world, were they perfect people? No not by any stretch of the imagination. One thing that my papa did that wasn't so perfect is when I was about four or five years old, we went to visit him in Arizona for Easter, and it was hot. Now, I grew up in Minnesota up here in the Midwest, and it was cold where I lived. And so I tried to wear shorts to an Easter service. Do you think that went over well? <laughs> no. Papa got really mad at me and yelled at me, and I, I broke down crying. And, but he reminded me in, in that whole interaction, it wasn't a good way for my Papa to handle that situation. He made me feel pretty bad about wearing shorts. But he also reminded me that God, God's house, when we come to worship, is a special place, and that's what he was trying to teach me. He did it imperfectly, but he was trying to be faithful. And so I hold on to him in that story, and whenever I wrap myself in his cardigan in my office, I remind myself that I don't need to be perfect either. I just need to be faithful and try my best. And we are reminded of that each and every Sunday as we gather around this font. So can you come on over with me here? 
Let's gather around this font because in this water we hear the promise of God that we are named and claimed by Jesus and, uh, and God tells us that we are loved. So I invite you, dip your fingers in the water. You can play with it a little bit, splash it around. And then I want you to mark a cross on your forehead, reminding yourself that you are loved by God. Now we're going to pray uh, together and then I'm going to send you out after dipping your fingers in the water one more time to bless someone out there in the assembly as well, reminding them that God loves them. So let us pray. Will you repeat after me? Dear God, oh, you can do better than that. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for the saints of our lives and their witness to the life of faith. Remind us you love us and remind us to love everyone. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, you can dip your fingers in the water one more time and bring a blessing out there. My apologies if anyone gets super wet. You may remain seated as we hear the word. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Today's reading is from 1 Kings. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 24. Now Elijah the Tisbite of Tisbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go from here and turn eastward, eastward and hide yourself by the wadi Cherith which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the wadi, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the wadi Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the wadi. But after a while, the wadi dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, and we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as I have said, but first make me a little cake and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she was, she was as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the oil, jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. 
She then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. But he said to her, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom, carried him up to the upper chamber where he was lodging, and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. The word of the Lord. We were somewhere just beyond Fargo, North Dakota, driving west on a freeway. Our car was teeming with excitement. My wife and I had just gotten married. We packed up all of our belongings into a U-Haul trailer and hitched that trailer to our 2019 Jeep Cherokee. Life was good. We were excited. The road before us stretched out, seeming like, seemingly like there was endless possibilities before us. It just felt so open, like life was never going to run out. Unfortunately, our gas tank was a different story. We neglected, I say we, I neglected, I was driving, to notice the gas gauge rapidly descending until, ding, my car let me know we had 50 miles to find a gas station. 50 miles in spotty cell phone service in the middle of North Dakota. I bared down on that steering wheel, my knuckles turning white from how strong I was gripping it, just willing the car to keep going as if my strength itself could will that car to keep rolling down the freeway. Life has a funny way of reminding us that we live in a world where enough is not always guaranteed. Sometimes it's the gas tank on the freeway. Other times it's more serious. Your bank account as bills come in, or food on the shelf in your pantry as you stretch your meals to last until next payday. Or maybe it's your own energy level at work or at home as you are handed yet another task that was someone else's responsibility. When resources dwindle and we feel depleted, our sense of joy, our strength, our hope, and even our faith can begin to feel like that gas gauge hovering near empty. We meet in our story today a widow who knows that feeling well. She's known this kind of scarcity and has lived in it day in and day out with only her last handful of meal, of flour, and a tiny bit of joy, oil in a jug. Enough, perhaps, to make one final meal for herself and her son before they face starvation. And then into her life walks Elijah with an audacious, Claim, that if she'll trust God with what little she has and share it with him, there will be enough for all of them. Just imagine what must have gone through that woman's mind when Elijah first asked for water and then for bread. She had nothing left, no family to support her, no fields to harvest no neighbors to spare anything. Every day had been a struggle to survive. 
Every day had been a fight to keep going, and now with no rain and no food, she resigned herself to the end. And yet here was this stranger, this prophet, promising that if she would give him what little she had, God would provide enough for her, her son, and even the prophet himself. The request is unbelievable, and frankly, laughable. What if it was a mistake, some sort of scam from this prophet? What if this stranger, Elijah, was wrong, and her last meal was wasted on his empty promise? She would be putting her life and the life of her son on the line. Trusting Elijah meant letting go of her last shred of security. So it would be understandable. In fact, it would be rather common sense for her to... Speaking of never uh, being guaranteed having enough... Batteries can be fickle. <laughs> it would be understandable if she held on to what little she had left. I know I probably would have. But somehow, even with all these doubts, she takes the risk and she moves forward. She moves forward trusting in the promise that God can sustain them. It's a risk born out of desperation, sure, but it's also an act of profound faith, choosing to believe that God's word might just hold her up, even when her resources run dry. Now, this widow's story isn't an isolated one. It's a part of a larger pattern that we see again and again woven through the fabric of Scripture. God has shown up for those in desperate situations before. We think of Hagar wandering through the wilderness with her young son crying out to God, and God heard her and provided for her. We think of the Israelites at large wandering also through the wilderness. God provided manna, the bread of heaven, for them, day by day, just enough to sustain them. This is who God has shown God's self to be, a God who provides, a God who has a special place for the vulnerable, the weary, and the brokenhearted. God provides what is needed when the drought first comes. In our story, Elijah is provided for by the wadi, a temporary riverbed, and he has water and is fed by scavenger birds. But when the wadi dries up and God's provision in that place ends, God sends Elijah to the widow in Zarephath. And when our widow's son falls ill, God's prophet makes yet another audacious request that the reality of death be proven a lie. And God heard the voice of Elijah, and the boy revived. In this story, as in so many others, we see God's power to provide, to sustain, and to ultimately give life where there seemed to be no possibility of it. But there is an even more audacious claim and hope that runs even deeper. In Christ, God's love doesn't just meet us in our scarcity. In Jesus' resurrection, it meets us in the very face of death. In Christ, we see the ultimate act of God's sustaining power, God's own determination to overcome the finality of death. In Jesus' resurrection, God's promise of life triumphing over the grave, we see completely. This is what we celebrate today on this All Saints Sunday. That for those who have gone before us, death does not have the final word. 
it is God's word that has the last say. And this word of life, this promise of resurrection hope is not just for the widow at Zarephath or the saints of old. It is for each and every one of us here. Through Christ, God has given us a hope that runs straight to the heart of our fear of scarcity. And it runs deeper than that scarcity and more enduring than our fear. It is the hope that even when everything runs out, when every resource runs dry, when everything seems to be coming to an end, God's promise of life holds us still. Reminds me of a story of a, a saint that I know well. John Johnson was the provider for his family. And at 96, he lay on his deathbed, surrounded by his family. And his daughter, Lisa, sat beside him, holding his hand. She had seen him face every challenge of life with strength and faith, but now he was fighting just to breathe. As she watched him struggle, Lisa took his hand, her dad's hand, and with love and assurance, thanked her dad for all he had given, for all he had done. And she told him that he could now let go, that his family would be okay because God was holding them now. And in that moment, John breathed his last and finally let go, but not into nothingness, he let go into the promise that God would sustain him even in death, a promise that God's hold on us is stronger than death's claim. On All Saints Sunday, we remember saints like John, our grandpas and grandpas, our friends, our neighbors, our sons and our daughters, who have trusted in this audacious hope we have in Christ. Saints who have showed us how to rest in God's faithful arms. We see in them, the saints of our lives, the hope that we too can live courageously, trusting God through our emptiest days. For this is our audacious claim, that even in a world of scarcity, God's life is abundant, God's Love is unending, and God's victory over death is ours. Thanks be to God, and amen.
With the whole people of God, let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God, in the God of life and resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of abundant provision, sustain your church with faith like the widow of Zarephath, trusting in your care even when resources seem scarce. Empower us to share the bread of life with those who hunger and proclaim hope to all who mourn. Strengthen the witness of your saints across every generation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of all life, renew the earth with your life-giving spirit and let your rain fall upon parched land as in the days of Elijah. Inspire us to, be, to steward your creation with care so that future generations may rejoice in its beauty and abundance. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of justice, bring your peace to lands torn by conflict and your justice to places marked by inequality. Raise up leaders with the courage of Elijah to speak truth and work for the good of all people. May your righteousness flow across the nations like a mighty stream. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, you raised the widow's son and restored him to life. Be present with those who grieve, comfort, comfort those who are sick, and provide for those in need of daily bread. Surround all who struggle with your sustaining care. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of the saints, we give you thanks for those from this congregation who have gone before us, trusting in your promises. Encourage us, like Elijah, to listen for your word and respond with faith that we may bear witness to your love in this community. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another by having a connecting conversation. What dish reminds you of home? Let us share a sign of Christ's peace.
invite you to continue your conversations about uh, what dish reminds you of home as we leave from this place. Um, you're welcome to join us in our lounge for a time of fellowship and, and coffee and, and some treats. Uh, so please continue those conversations there. Thank you all so much for the generosity that you show this community. Without you, there is no way that we could live out the mission and calling we all have been given. So thank you. I invite you now to stand as you are comfortable as we receive these gifts in prayer. God of abundance, we dedicate our lives and all that we have to the work of life, of love, of peace. Receive our gifts and lead us in wisdom and courage. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the witness of your saints, you show us the hope of our calling and, strength run, uh, and strengthen us to run the race set before us that we may delight in your mercy and rejoice with them in glory. And so with all the saints, with all the choirs of angels and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, full of your glory, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for a couple instructions while our communion volunteers come forward. You'll be invited to come to the altar in, uh, to one of three stations by the ushers. You will receive a wafer in your hand, which you may eat. You will then receive a small cup, which you may drink. We have gluten-free and alcohol-free options available, so just let us know what you may need. And if you have any mobility concerns whatsoever, please let the ushers know. They'll let us know, and we will come to you. For this table is set for all people, and you are welcome here. So come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace, grant us peace, Lamb of God.
you may remain seated for the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit. Proclaim your story of love to the world. Amen. We are sent out into the world to proclaim this story of love. And to do that here at Calvary, we like to take a moment uh, to recognize our mission and, and uh, all the things that are happening in and around our community. Today we are highlighting our funeral care ministries, and I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who is involved in making our funeral care ministries possible. Thank you to Chris Krieger and uh, Jim Lemons for setting up and helping serve our uh, funeral meals. Thank you to all of the grumpies who spend time uh, setting up all of the tables and chairs. Thank you to Kent and the choir for providing lovely music uh, for those services. And thank you to folks like Shar Gillis and our other funeral home workers who walk with families in their time of grieving. Thank you. Can we give them all a round of applause? One other major announcement uh, for you today. You may have received a card that looks like this in the mail recently. Um, it is for our stewardship campaign. This is the 2025 commitment form. Um, please fill this out and bring it in by next week. For those of you who have already sent this card in to us, we've received several already. Thank you. Um, next week during the offering, uh, there will be a chance, if you still have this at home, uh, to bring it forward. Uh, uh, during the offering, so please bring this with you next week or mail it in as soon as you can. Thank you for your contributions to this community. Without you, as I say every week, there is no way that we could all live out our mission that God has called us to here. So thank you. With that, I invite you to stand as you are comfortable for our final blessing and sending. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing. Our sending hymn for all the saints is a hymn that has been used for well over 20 years at Calvary for virtually every funeral as the family is departing the church. So that's uh, one thing that we always do on For All the Saints Sunday. Go in peace, tell the story. Thanks be to God.